with Gavin Wood. He's the chief architect of Polkadot, fellowship member, rank six, here again on the program today to talk specifically about governance. Gavin, thank you very, very much for being here and welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me on again. I think governance is a really broad topic. It covers capital, reputation, nepotism, fortune, birthright, violence. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's something very innate about it. Think about children on a schoolyard. You know, there's this authority maybe on the other end of the playground, but amongst themselves, they're able to come to a consensus. They're able to decide what to do. I suppose it's um, this notion of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Forming a, a coherent group allows you to do um, do things that you just can't do as, as, a, as a single individual. And mm. oftentimes, you know, there's a, there's a, maybe there's an eventual limit, but usually the bigger the group, at least in the early stages, the more, uh, the greater this um, potentiality, the greater this, this um, improvement in what you can do. And I think this is probably, you know, clear even on the playground as, a, as an eight-year-old, hmm. like the games that you can play if you all agree to play the, by the rules. Hmm. And the games can be more interesting. It's like, a, even today, I play cards, two-player games of cards, not so much fun sure. compared to three-player, four-player, five-player games of cards, right? I eventually hit a limit, and you know maybe there's too many people in the game when you get to, like, nine players or something. But um, And it's certainly true in these early stages. Like, one one-player game of cards, solitaire, that's really not so much fun compared <laughs> to, like, you know, bridge or something. Sure. Game, right? Governance is really just this, uh, you know, taken at its at its broadest sense. It's really just forming a collective that, that abides by um, some rules. Hmm. Now, of course, there's questions about determining what rules they abide by, enforcing the rules, and so forth. But in principle, it's it's not so very much different from a kind of You kind of hinted in the last time we were together about a competition to create a voting system for. What was it, the UK Parliament or something mm, like that? Yeah. What was that all about? So this is uh, going back to, I think, 2008-ish. Okay. Reforming the voting system yes. became a, um, a thing. Mm -hmm. The reason, in part, it became a thing was because um, while normally a two-party system... Um, briefly, it became a three-party system. The third party, Liberal Democrats, um, managed to score enough of the um, uh, parliament um, that they become, you know, not merely kingmakers um, for a hung parliament, but actually um, they had a substantial, I, know, I think it was like 25, 35, 40. So they actually had a substantial propor uh, portion of the vote. Hmm. And of course... Uh, in a first-past-the-post system, it's wildly uh, disproportionate. So while they had, you know, a quarter of all parliamentarians, they had something like a third or even, uh, even you know, more uh, of the overall votes of the country. So it was very much in their interest to change the voting system so it's proportionally representative of people's preferred uh, parties. So they would list, like, I would want this one first, this one second. So like the that. idea, uh, at its basic level, I mean, it depends a lot, <laughs> lots of different uh, means of counting votes, but um, at the basic level, you have one preference. Um, uh, you count them all up, hmm. and then you assign um, a proportional amount of parliament of representatives. So if you count up, if there's 100 million people in the country and there's 100 seats in Parliament, mm -hmm. um, then more or less it's about a million votes per seat. So if as a party you get 10 million votes, you would have 10 seats. This would be proportionally representative. Okay. It still wouldn't be potentially very good because it might be that you have parties where they're everybody's second choice but um, nobody's first choice. Right, yeah. And then it's like... If you don't collect the second choices, you can't adequately utilize that information. Mm -hmm. And so then you end up with systems like, I don't know, approval voting and um, board accounts and all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. um, to try to better introduce this information into the final aggregation. Better introduce the idea that, well, you know, it might be that people don't have a single party that they are 100% behind and yeah. with all of the parties being 0% behind. <laughs> right. Maybe there's a yeah, combination that they're quite happy with. Sure. Um, the, the idea was to take uh, what the UK had currently been using, which is a first-past-the-post 
system. Mm-hmm. So basically, the UK is split up into constituencies, so regions yeah. of around 50,000 people each. Mm-hmm. Um, and then each region votes independently, um, such that there is, they just count which person gets the the most votes. In that region, like an MP or something. Exactly. Yeah. And then that person gets sent to parliament and right. they represent that region. Okay. Um, so you can easily have it in, in, a, in a heavily split um, region where someone gets there with 30% of the turnout voters and even less of the actual uh, residents. Yeah, right. Okay. There are some like places in I know, like Northern Ireland where turnout is super low. It's like, you know, 15,000, 10,000 people out okay. of like 50,000. And they get a whole seat in the parliament. And then, yeah, of, of those, maybe 40% of the, of the voters yeah. actually uh, uh, command who goes to, uh, the ones that voted for the person that goes to parliament. So it's like, mm. uh, it, it's not proportional in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, and how much influence you have depends a lot on where you where in which constituency you live in sure. what the turnout is what everybody else in that constituency what parties they like if you happen to live in a constituency where more than 50% of your fellow constituents will will always vote for one particular party absolutely set on one particular party your vote literally doesn't matter <laughs> right it yeah. doesn't matter who you vote for because right. 50% like this guy is going to to parliament regardless yeah. of yeah. what the other 49% vote <laughs> mm-hmm. So we see that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, right. And there's, I don't know, 10 representatives, and it'll be all 10, <laughs> and they'll go with a 51% party. And it's like, what? It should be five and five, surely. Crazy, <laughs> okay. But yeah, so the idea was, well, let's, um, let's have a system where we don't break the old system. So this is one of the, one of the key propositions of the thing that I was bringing forward. Hmm. Um, people get weirded out by proportional representation, in part because it's um, they start voting for party rather than person. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, is is I don't know, maybe it's questionable, maybe it's not, but, like, there is, a, there is an argument that in a voting system uh, where we are voting, um, we are delegating our uh, democratic authority to a third party, um, that we should know which third party we are delegating that authority to, like mm. which person is actually going to be representing us. This is this is one of the sort of um, an argument for, um, uh, for for this democratic model. I mm-hmm. should delegate to a person, not to a group. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's strong. Um, so it should support both. Uh, so the proposition was it should support both delegating to person and delegating to party. And secondly, that it should retain, in the case of delegating the person, the constituency model. Hmm. So you still vote within your constituency. Hmm. The key difference with the model is to the current first-past-the-post system. So it retains a constituency model. Um, Members of parliament represent a constituency. Um, It retains the ability for you to vote vote within your constituency for your um, person, uh, who may or may not be affiliated with a party. The key difference is that there's an extra box next to uh, on the on the voting sheet, which yeah. is I don't mind being temporarily moved to another constituency if it helps get the party of the person I'm voting in. So it's like because in the UK, and this this is based around the, the idea that within the the, the, the country um, there is freedom of movement, hmm. right? So it doesn't matter. I, I can. I am free to move to move from Lancaster to York if I want to do so. Sure. Nothing. There is nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, it's sort of similar in the in the EU, right? I'm free to move from Belgium to Germany if I so if I desire as an EU citizen. Hmm. I'm not one at the moment, but I will be hopefully soon. <laughs> this is a, a basic port part of, of living in a free country, that you are free to move in the country. Yeah, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so then the idea is, well, it, then in that case, it doesn't make sense to, um, to limit my vote uh, geographically. If I'm free to move, why would my vote be limited to only uh, uh, being used in this constituency? Now, maybe I don't want my vote to be used to vote for someone other than this very particular person. Maybe. But I suspect in a lot of cases, people don't vote for the person, they vote for the party, in which case yeah, they would yeah. check the box. I don't care if my vote is used for this person or someone else from the same party. Okay. Now, what happens is we have this algorithm 
<laughs> and what it does is it basically says, right, the algorithm is free to move people temporarily, purely for the purposes of voting, from one constituency to another constituency and vote instead in their election. Hmm. Right? Their vote gets removed from the constituency that they were notionally in originally, and instead their, their vote is used in this new constituency. Mm. And what the algorithm is able to do is basically take um, constituencies that are, that, have, that are the most unanimous and say, right, all of the people who didn't vote for the winner... Hmm. Why would they and, and have checked the extra box saying they don't mind if their vote's hmm. moved? Why would they? Why would they bother staying there? That's interesting. So what we do is we move them elsewhere. But in order to move them elsewhere, we require the winning party to fill them up with a member of a, a voter from themselves. So what they do is they move one of their voters from a losing uh, constituency, one where they're never going to win. They've only got like. 200 people, sure. 200 okay. voters, right? Okay. And they move those voters out, drain that constituency, which they're gonna never going to win anyway, and instead replace them with the the voters that no longer want to vote in their winning constituency, sure. okay. right? Yeah. Because they're, they're never going to win either. Right. Um, and so they basically swap. It identifies constituencies where basically we, we move people, we swap them over in order to have, broadly speaking, constituencies that are unanimous. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you can't make it perfectly unanimous. Some people don't want to leave. And there will be instances where um, you can't find a pair, a pair, another sort of a paired, um, you can't pair two constituencies because they don't have people um, that would want to swap. Yeah. Okay. But in general, you'll be able to find constituencies that do have people that want to swap. With the idea being that as much as you can, uh, the algorithm... Um, delivers constituencies that are unanimous. And then, because the constituencies are unanimous, um, we end up with a more or less proportional representation.